Hello, so today we're going to do the first part of parametric approaches for controlling family-wise error rate, and we're going to focus on Bonferroni. Make sure you're ready. Do you know the different ways we can threshold statistic maps? Also, do you know the difference between PCER, FWER, and FDR? If not, revisit the thresholding brain, map, brain stat maps and different types of error rates lectures. Also, the last lecture um, that I had was the first time I started looking at um, error rates with MATLAB code, which I'm also going to do today. So actually going through the code from the last time might help you understand the code from today because I'm not going to um, uh, explain, for example, the smoothing. Anyhow, today we are going to focus on family-wise error rate, which is the error rate that Bonferroni controls. Back to our friend, this two by two table, recall the columns are what we know. We either declare a voxel active or inactive. Again, lazy language, this should have been failed to declare active. Um, the rows are what the oracle tells us. Either we, the voxels truly are non-active or they are active. So since we're focused on false positives and specifically family-wise error rate, that's this number here, 50. If I have a 5% error rate and my voxels are independent, which we learned last time, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to fill in the number on this table if my uh, tests weren't independent. Anyway, of my 1,000 non-active voxels, 5% or 50 will be declared active. So of course, with our brain data where we have 200,000 voxels, this number gets so big. And as we saw last time with smoothing, um, those false positive things look real, so we want to make sure we're, we're doing everything we can to reduce this number to prevent false positives from occurring. So what family-wise error rate does is it's very strict. Um, it takes the, the probability it's controlling is the probability of having any false positives. Okay, so it's trying to strictly keep this number at zero. So remember, if you close your eyes and remember those simulations from a few lectures ago, they'll come up again later. The family-wise error rate row of simulated data, you had your 10 studies and only one out of 10 studies had any false positives. So that's the type of error rate we're focusing on today. Right, so what does family-wise error rate look like and how does Bonferroni relate to it? So this is the Bonferroni inequality. I'm going to unpack this here in a second. But um, maybe I should have just shown this left-hand side here is uh, related to family-wise error rate because family-wise error rate is controlling the, the probability of having any false positives. So the, the probability if each of these events, E1, E2 through EN, was a null voxel being active, we're trying to, pre to control the probability of voxel 1 being active or voxel 2 being active or voxel n being active. So that is exactly this, number of null declared active. Okay, so um, with probabilities, if you have ors, um, to break up this big thing, uh, this big joint probability into the individual probabilities, you can... And what it looks like is the sum of the individual probabilities that I'm showing here, but then there are typically a bunch of other terms that I'm not showing. So why aren't the terms here? And uh, what's going on here? So basically the other terms have to do with when the events are correlated. So then you have to consider the individual joint distributions, say of E1 and E2 together, and then E1, 2, and 3, and E1, 2, 3, 4. But when they're uncorrelated, this would actually be inequality. But if they are correlated, we have to put this less than sign. This left-hand quantity is actually smaller than this because there are terms missing here that are negative. So does that make sense? So we're trying to control this. This big old uh, multiple, uh, this big, big distribution is really hard to quantify or to know. Um, we're not going to come up with a joint uh, T statistic that has n dimensions or something like that. So instead what we do is we simplify it because we can figure out the distributions for the individual voxels and we can control probabilities within each of those. Okay, so um, again, inequality with correlation equals when there is no correlation. 
So the idea is we're gonna work with this right-hand side. If we control each of these, instead of at alpha, at alpha over n, then if we sum up over n of them, uh, n times alpha over n will just simply be alpha. So replacing E1 with the probability that yi passes given the null. Um, so this is just the same as saying E1 in a way. Um, if we control this probability less than alpha over n, actually, sorry, it's this, then the probability that some yi passes under the null, so this is just the same as this, is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities individually, which will then be less than alpha. So just to recap this slide, this over here represents our probability that is family-wise error rate. So we would like to keep less, this less than 0.05. And the way we're going to do that is by using in place of it, this summation, we're gonna control this summation, make it less than um, 0.05. So that's what this is. Importantly, this is a less than. So we're going to see that Bonferroni can be conservative. Yeah, so if you have 100,000 voxels, your, your threshold is going to be this thing, 0 0.00000005, which is super small. And um, you can go ahead and apply that to your data and see what happens. Um, you probably won't find anything. Uh, Bonferroni can be too conservative because, as I just said, it assumes all of our tests are independent, our data are not, uh, our voxels are spatially correlated. So the number of independent tests is smaller than the number of voxels. So if, if we have 100,000 voxels and we're putting 100,000 here, but in reality, um, maybe there are only, I don't know, 50,000 independent tests then that's, you know, we're being too stringent. Unfortunately, we can't figure out this number of independent tests. It's very tricky. So we're going to do a MATLAB demo. I'm going to simulate null data and use the Bonferroni correction. So, but this simulation is slightly different than before because we're focusing on family-wise error rates. So it's another reason why I like the simulation because it really drives, drives it on home uh, what family-wise error rate is looking at. So... How are we going to simulate this? Um, again, family-wise error rate is controlling any false positives. So let's go back to this. Remember, this is what I was trying to get you to close your eyes and picture earlier. In order to compute family-wise error rate, I actually had to simulate, or I didn't, um, these, this was made by Tom Nichols, multiple studies worth of data. So last time we just simulated a brand of data and tried to look at the per comparison error rate over the brain and how that was uh, affected by smoothing. So now we're down here. So our simulation is going to have an extra loop in it to loop through creating um, a thousand data sets. And then we're going to count the probability of any false positives. All right. So here's the code. Again, go down into the info box and you will find it. I'm actually going to start it running. And while it's running, I'll explain what the code does. Okay. So the first part is with uh, independent voxels. So this, this, is, this is to show you that Bonferroni actually does work. As I said, we need lots of studies. I, if I were you, if you had the time, change this to 5,000. Um, you'll get a better estimate. 1,000 is not much, but we don't have a lot of time. Like last time, I'm going to work with, it's not 100 voxels, it's actually a 100 by 100 square. So it's very similar to this but it's going to be 100 by 100, except all null voxels. There's no red circle with activation in the middle. And right, 30 subjects for the study. That These are just the vectors I'm going to fill with the false positive rates um, for each study. All right, so I'm going to go through each study. I'm going to create the data. So this is just like last time. I just random normal noise. And then I compute the t-statistic by taking the mean and the standard deviation. This is just the equation for one sample t-test, um, which is faster than using the t-test function. And then I compute the p-value. And then last, I'm just computing the false positive within each study. So if you take the 
This is a 0, 1 vector. Um, so it's how many p-values are less than 0.05. So if I take the mean of a 0, 1 vector, that'll give me the um, proportion of voxels that were significant. And here I'm doing the same thing, but it's Bonferroni corrected. So I'm taking 0 0.05 and dividing by n vox times n vox. Okay, and then what I have is a false positive rate vector for uncorrected in Bonferroni. So I'm just checking um, any false positives. So that would mean that that element in that vector was greater than zero because it's the proportion of false positives. So obviously this one's going to fail. That's what gave this one. 100% 1 of the studies, if you apply no correction, are going to have a false positive. That's not a surprise. That's, I mean, all you need is one significant voxel for that to fail. And here, Bonferroni came out at 0.044. Again, if you change this to 5,000 and run it, you're going to find that it's, it's 0.05. If I ran it again, it's 0.05. So that's not, um, um, that's just because I, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and run 5,000 simulations. So do that on your own time, and you'll see it comes out at a nice solid 0.05. So that's cool. So now let's see what happens when we smooth the data. So this code's exactly the same as the code in the above chunk. The only difference is here's the kernel um, for smoothing the data spatially. Uh, I set the radius to 10 voxels. So all I did was I plopped in this extra loop here to smooth the data over subjects. I should start this and stop talking because this one takes longer. All right, so this is everything else is exactly the same as above, except now I'm smoothing the data. All right, we'll come back to this for the exciting conclusion. Let's see, what can I do while well, well, that's running? So, what do you guys think is going to happen with the smooth data? Will the uh, Bonferroni correction? be conservative? Will my false positive rates be too high? Or will the false positive rate be too low? Is it going to be less than 0.05 or greater than 0.05? Go back to this inequality and think about it. I mean, I already said the answer, but you can think about it again. So this is less than or equal to. So this is the truth. This is what we're using in place of the truth. So... All right, here's the answer. Hopefully you thought it's going to be way less than 0.05, and it is. So this is why we can't use Bonferroni on our brain data is because there would be no hope of us finding anything. Um, 0 .000, 0 0.007 is super small. We wanted this, again, to be 0.05. And of course, the per comparison or error rate is going to fail every time. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Fiddle around with the code, do stuff with it. Um, you know, that's how you learn. All right, make sure you have all that. Why doesn't the Bonferroni correction work with our imaging data? That should be pretty clear. Um, why does smoothing make multiple comparisons correction more tricky? Um, at least for Bonferroni, you should understand what that is. So thanks, please do join the Facebook group. Here you go, and um, I thought of something else to say. Actually, yeah, just want to point out the code I'm giving you guys. Nope, we're not there yet. Anyway, please join the Facebook group and uh, have a great day. Thank you.